go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here. Thank you so much for joining us and attending our monthly CNS. Uh, Join the meeting. My name is Allison Sherwood. I'm the Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences. And as many of you know, through our Polina Au webinar series, we're aiming to share a lot of the world-class research that happens in the College of Natural Sciences with the broader community. And so today, our presentation is going to feature Dr. Jason Lee. He's a professor in the Information and Computer Sciences Department. He's going to be speaking to us on visualizing a future of work for Hawaii. But first, I would like um, to have Sarah Lynn Smith say a few words. She is the University of Hawaii Foundation a representative for the College of Natural Sciences. Sarah Lynn, have you joined us? All right, maybe she's not in with us yet. We will come back to her towards the end. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing Dr. Lee then. Uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Jason Lee is the director of the Lava Lab. This is the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization and Applications, co-director of the Hawaii Data Science Institute, and a professor of information and computer sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, he's also the director of CreateX at the Academy for Creative Media at the University of Hawaii at West Oahu. He's also Director Emeritus of the Electronic Visualization Lab and the Software Technologies Research Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he was previously a professor of computer science and affiliated professor of communications. In addition, he was a fellow of the Institute for Health Research and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago and has held research appointments at Argonne National Laboratory and the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. His research expertise includes data visualization, virtual reality, high performance networking, and video game design. His research has received enormous news media attention, including the AP News, the New York Times, Popular Science's Future Of, Nova Science Now, NSF Science Now, PBS, and Forbes. And so with that, I would like to turn over the platform to Dr. Lee for his presentation. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Allison. And I, I, if I had known you were going to read my, my, my bio to its absolute fullest, I would have given you a shorter one. I'm sorry for torturing you with that. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you all for, for listening. Um, I do a lot of research and development in computer science, but I didn't want to go into that level of detail today, but I, I wanted to sort of emphasize how a lot of the work that I'm working on you know, ultimately, and that, you know, this is the role for us as professors in the university, how this translates to employment for the future generation of Hawaii's kids. Um, I want to start with how I got into this field of computer science first. And, you know, it, it might help you understand all the crazy and maybe not so rational things that I did with, with my life. Um, first of all, um, I grew up in Hong Kong. Uh, this is uh, back in the, the 1980s when I was uh, close to, uh, you know, starting my college career and going to the University of Utah. Um, I, you know, as like in any, in, like for any Asian kid, you know, your parents are like, well, you know, you should really become either a doctor or a chemical engineer or an engineer or a uh, uh, a pharmacist or a dentist, because those are kind of like the safe professions and you're insured to get a job. Uh, I, of course, had no interest in those. And what I got into was computers, because back in the 80s, where, when the Apple II just started coming out and the Atari computers were coming out and, uh, you know, I couldn't afford these expensive computers. So I scraped up every last penny of my savings and I bought my first computer and my dad thought that was the end of it. It was just a, you know, like a hobby or a curiosity. And I got so into uh, computers, not because I liked playing video games. It was because I was mesmerized by the video games and I wanted to figure out how do these video games work? How do I make my own video games? Then one day, you know, I, I was so obsessed with this, I kept hanging out at the Atari store in downtown Hong Kong. And they kind of took pity on me. And they said, hey, you know, there's this workshop that's happening. It's run by this guy, his name is Chris Crawford. 
and it's about video game development in the on the Atari platform. And I said, oh yeah, of course I want to go. And so I sat in that workshop, and that was probably the single most uh, inspiring thing that that caused me to realize that computer science was where I wanted it to be. And this guy was a complete crazy man. He was so excited about what he was doing with computers. And classically, he was a physicist, a uh, trained physicist. And he was developing some of the most amazing video games for Atari. And they were all based on science, on physics. So he built like a new, turned a nuclear reactor simulator essentially into a video game where you learn how to not crash your nuclear reactor, but also uh, learn to you know, uh, have fun while, you, while you're trying to do this and learn a little bit of, of a nuclear, you know, nuclear physics. And then one day I, was, I picked up this magazine at the store. It was, the magazine was called Analog Computing. And I was flipping through the articles and I thought, wow, look at all these com computer articles. They had all these programs in them and you could type them in and you can make them run. And I thought, maybe I can do something like this. So uh, at the time, Atari had just released this Atari 1020 was a, a plotter that lets you do computer graphics on paper, plots things, but it was really difficult to work with. So I worked, with, I kind of just out of a hobby, I developed a software language to let you type commands and control the plotter and you can make cool graphics. And I wrote it up as an article and you know, this is the 80s. So I literally wrote the article on a typewriter, not even an electric typewriter, a manual typewriter. And I sent it off to the United States. Back then, it took about a month for mail to go from Hong Kong to the United States and come back. And, and to my surprise, a letter came back from the United States and they said, thank you for your article. We'd like to publish it for $40 US. And I showed it to my dad and he was like, just shocked that someone would actually pay me for an article in America. You know, this, this Hong Kong kid who didn't really know an awful lot. And it was my uncle who basically said, you know, this, he really seems to take to this computer stuff. Maybe he should consider applying for, uh, you know, computer science when he goes to college. And so when I landed at the University of Utah, I basically, instead of going to the pharmacy department, I, I you know, Turn left and I went to computer science, and I kind of never looked back. Um, but what was really important for me at that moment when I when I met Chris Crawford, and by the way, Chris Crawford now is considered considered a legend in video game design, a, a worldwide legend in video games. The fact that I was able to even learn programming from a legend is just amazing. But his enthusiasm was so infectious. And the fact that the Atari store would just allow me to hang out and use their stuff motivated basically me all my life that when I create a lab where students work in them, that I create that same kind of environment to give them the freedom to explore their dreams and their ideas. And that's always stuck with me. So if you ever have a chance to come visit my lab, you'll understand because it's just this awesome fun place for kids to hang out and do creative things. So moving a little bit forward, um, when I started my PhD, it was in the 1990s, I went to the Electronic Visualization Laboratory at the University of Illinois at Chicago. This lab was world famous for being pioneers in virtual reality, but it also did the first computer graphics for this, the, the, the Star Wars movie in the 1970s. So, you know, when, when Luke Skywalker had to blow up the Death Star and you saw this 3D wireframe model, that was actually done in Chicago in this lab. So when I worked in Chicago, I worked in virtual reality. I was, you know, I'm considered a pioneer in virtual reality because of all my work back in the 90s. But my PhD was I worked with General Motors to use virtual reality to allow them to design cars, automobiles, and, and evaluate the interiors by sitting in a virtual reality experience and, and to see if those designs will work before they actually go and manufacture them, right? So this is back in the 90s. And so nowadays, this is really becoming a common part of automobile design. And uh, about 10 years ago, I was looking on a BMW brochure and I saw the exact same virtual reality system. And I said, hey, I did that. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Hawaii, and let's talk about the future of work. Uh, 
Some of you may know uh, our vice president for innovation, uh, Vasilis Shermos. When I first arrived, Vasilis shared this bit of information about Hawaii to me. He said, basically, Hawaii stands on two primary legs, tourism and the military. And of course, it's, it's a bit of an unstable chair to sit on, right? And we need something to help sort of help stabilize Hawaii in the event of something were to happen, like if one of the legs were to fail. And so the closest thing to Hawaii, as Lil said, was uh, San Diego. And because San Diego in the beginning were also mostly dependent on defense and military, uh, defense and, and tourism, but they realized they had to expand out further. And so they expanded to international trade, technology, life sciences, and real estate. And in fact, in the area of technology, they're a major powerhouse in science and technology now because of the huge investment um, California made in amplifying their, their, their universities uh, in San Diego. So, and, and now, you know, Facilis is so concerned for, you know, Hawaii's, you know, legs of the, of the stool really ran true during COVID. Right. This is some of you've seen these pictures. This is Waikiki that essentially got boarded up during COVID, and basically tourism just completely stopped. And you know, of all the states in the United States that were hit the worst by the pandemic financially, it was Hawaii because of our heavy, heavy reliance on tourism. And so, but what happened also was more of the people who were in the sort of computerized digital sector were going online. And but they were still doing fine. And in fact, many of the companies that worked are that focused mainly on the IT and technological sectors were doing fantastic. Netflix was through the roof. Uh, Amazon, it was through the roof, right? Where stocks went crazy. Nvidia that makes graphics cards for video game cards, Zoom, Tesla, right? Through the roof. And if you look at some of the statistics from the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics, actually, I looked at the statistic in 2019, and it was like supposedly 11% growth from 2020 to 2019. But looking at it again recently, they, they reposted it, it's now 13%, it's going even faster as compared to other occupations, which are roughly about 4% growth. The median wage for computer scientists is $91,000 compared to all other occupations, it's only like, you know, less than half. Even if you're an artist, sort of tainted with computing and technology, you're gonna get about 77, you know, almost $80,000 as a, as, a, as a salary. And, you know, if you wanna break it down even further, which I, I won't bore you with, but look at these, all these salaries are really high. And look, they're mostly bachelors. We're not talking about a master's yet, you know, in the master's case, you go up to 126,000, and then and we're not even talking about PhDs, right? And so what started for me as a 1980s hobby, I didn't know I was going to get anywhere with this. I just loved it, right? But now it's just exploding and has continued to explode and transform the, the world. And literally in the past 20 years, uh, industries like the music industry, the book industry, the movie industry, the hotel industry, the, the taxi industry have all been tr transformed and in some cases disrupted by technology. We have Disney Plus, HBO Max, right, which all came out of COVID uh, because people can't go into theaters anymore and people wanted to watch movies and binge on movies, right? Amazon, how do you buy stuff? Airbnbs, Uber, YouTube, right? These are all technology, uh, technology uh, based on technology that disrupted the industries. Now, the next big wave coming, some of you may have already heard this, is, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger's T-1000 is going to come and rule the world. Well, it's not quite that dramatic. Um, but in fact, uh, the financial sector has been using artificial intelligence for the long time. You know, most of the stock trading that's done in the stock markets are not done by humans. Humans cannot respond fast enough to the stock market anymore. You know, you don't have people calling out stocks. It's computers doing the trading. Um, 
to you know, look at how climate change is affecting the coral reefs. These are done by taking large amounts of photographs and using artificial intelligence to analyze them, to find cancer in the human body, right? Using you know, x-rays and so forth, it's using artificial intelligence algorithms to help the doctor not miss any of the cancers that are out there. But to, to be even more dramatic, uh, I don't know how many of you own a Tesla and I've tried this out, or actually don't try this out, it's a, it's a scary thing to try out or have to experience. But this video alone kind of would convince me to buy a Tesla. <laughs> so watch on this side of the road. This car or a bunch of cars here are about to pile up and hit these other cars in the chain. The only car that escapes unscathed is the Tesla. Watch this. Here we go. There's the, here's the SUV. Bam. Bam. And what happened to the Tesla? Well, we're going to zoom in and you're going to see what happened to the Tesla. Bam. Bam. Look at that. So the Tesla didn't get hit because the Tesla had all these cameras in them looking backwards and it knew there was an impending threat to its safety and it accelerated immediately to avoid the crash, but stopped just in time not to hit the vehicle in front. No human can do this because frankly, when you're sitting in traffic, you're not looking behind you, right? You're probably looking on your cell phone, right? Embarrassingly, right? So this is, this is, this is the, the amazing thing that artificial intelligence can contribute to, to you know, our, 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 our abilities to help us in these kind of risky situations. Okay, so now, you know, people have sort of recognized that with this kind of innovative new technology that there is potential that people are going to lose their jobs. And so the World Bank projects that in 20 years, 50% of the jobs will disappear in the Western world, Western world, based on automation and, and, and things like artificial intelligence. In the non-Western world, it's about 70% will disappear. Uh, and so you say, okay, maybe we shouldn't do this artificial intelligence because it's gonna lose people jobs. Well, unfortunately, we cannot go backwards in time anymore. We can't say, you know, we're just going to go back and stick to the horse and buggy days because all the other countries in the world are going to march on forward and advance, which means that we will have zero competitive edge against these other countries in the future. And in fact, we are starting to see some of that, like in countries like China, these are the uh, research AI research papers that are generated by China since 2000 in artificial intelligence compared to the research papers that are generated by the United States, right? So they are catching up very, very fast. And China claims that they, are, they want to be the number one top dog in artificial intelligence in the future. The United States is responding to that very quickly, realizing that that's gonna, that could happen by forming the national artificial intelligence research institutes. We started around 2020, and these are the locations where some of the institutes are popping up. A couple of the faculty at UH are part of these institutes. We don't have our own institute yet, and so, but this is what we want to strive for so that we are part of the international arena that's, that's considered leaders in this, in this field that's going to be so impactful in the future of humanity. So, so going back to COVID a bit, so COVID has really created an opportunity, I think, for Hawaii, because I'm observing, even within my students, they would graduate and they would, they would get a job instantaneously because they work in the computer field, but they, and these jobs are actually in the mainland, but they're allowed to stay and work and remain in, at home in Hawaii. So I've got kids who grew up in Kaneohe, right, in Kauai, and now they can just stay where they are and work for these large companies and really draw in very, very competitive salaries. So, but what we have to do moving forward is that we have to prepare them. We need to teach students how to develop 
and or use artificial intelligence intelligence to augment where humans are weakest. We're not interested in replacing humans. We want to augment our abilities so we can do more, right? Or we can or we can have artificial intelligence do the work and we can just go surfing all the time, which is what I would love to do. <laughs> um, and but also we want to complement the students with skills that artificial intelligence is not good at, like creativity, collaboration, culture, entrepreneurship. These are the things that AI cannot do. AIs are not going to start companies yet, right? This is all a human thing, right? Collaborating with humans, culture is a human thing. So we need to also simultaneously strengthen this, especially in the AI in the AI world. And I'm going to walk you through some of the projects that are related to this um, that we've been working on. So the three the three places I, I want to take you to very briefly are my lab, the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization and Applications, and the Hawaii Data Science Institute. This is an institute that I co-direct with Gwen Jacobs, who's the head of uh, cyber infrastructure for the UH uh, system, I, um, you know, ITS uh, system-wide. And then also CreateX, which is a new lab that I started uh, in 2021, that is January, at UH West Oahu. First, let's jump to lava. And I'll just give you a, a, and some ideas of some of the things that we've done. Uh, so this is Noel. No, his, his mother is uh, Hawaiian, his father is Japanese. I first met Noel when he was giving a talk in one of his classes, and Noel was kind of a misfit in engineering. He was kind of like, well, you know, I'm kind of arty, artistic, and I'm kind of technical. And so he created this little LED electronic board, which synchronizes to music. He loves music, right? And he synchronizes the music. It was really awesome, kind of a disco thing. He loves disco, you know. And he said, well, and I, and I built this at home in my garage, and it cost me 100 bucks. And, you know, if I, really, if I had $140 more, I could buy all these parts, and I could build this next great thing. I was sitting in the audience, and I was so ready to write him a $140 check <laughs> because this guy had so much passion. And I said, you know, you're going to work for me, Noel. I told, I told myself, you, this kid's going to work for me. And funny enough, and I didn't know this until I met him and we, he started working for me. I did hire him, by the way. He said he had seen me in a talk about the work that I do. And he said, someday I'm going to work for him. So like, wow, this is just so cool. So when, when Noel worked for me, he helped me develop something called the Cyber Canoe the cyber enabled collaboration analysis and navigation environment. And this is like the world's highest resolution virtual reality system in the world. It lets you look at scientific data at an exquisite resolution that you that's never been possible. Think of it as like the most powerful microscope you could ever build to look at biology, right? Or the most powerful telescope that you can build to look at the sky, but looking at computing data. Right, so here you can here you're inside a giant uh, molecular simulation, right? Um, and so this experience that we I, that Noel got from building the cyber canoe, developing the software for the cyber canoe, right, um, was ultimately what allowed him to immediately, when he graduated, get a job at the aerospace company in in Los Angeles, basically leading their virtual reality division. Another similar story is Dylan Kobayashi. He's, you know, um, born in Hawaii. His father was, uh, I think, a dentist. And uh, he worked on a project called SAGE to allow people to come to decisions more effectively by looking at data displayed on large display walls. This project was funded by National Science Foundation, and I had been supporting him from his master's all the way through to his PhD. And uh, part of this involves the incorporation of artificial intelligence to help people who are trying to make decisions about large amounts of data do that with greater confidence, greater accuracy, greater speed. And so we got additional funding from the Army's research lab to try and take some of this technology and merge it into the Army uh, research groups. And this was, uh, ultimately uh, uh, funded by them, 
we were able to get a small business innovation research grant with Oceanit. And then when Dylan graduated, Oceanit immediately snatched him up, right? So here's a major success story. Katrina, she's a, um, a grade school teacher uh, who, in Kaneohe. She decided to re retrain herself, retool, an amazingly analytical person. Uh, she basically decided, I'm going to get a master's degree in computer science. She worked with me on a project called NetSage, which was, I'm going to pause these so that it doesn't freak out my animations here, uh, to basically take all the data that National Science Foundation collects on the amount of network traffic that is transmitted between locations around the world to try and make discoveries about science using the data that's collected by these research uh, researchers. And so Katrina worked on this project and immediately after graduation, she got a job offer with Department of Energy, uh, ESNet, which is actually based in Berkeley, California. But again, remember uh, COVID world, you can work remotely. Katrina still works in Kaneohe, but remotely in Berkeley, you know, from, from staying in Kaneohe to Berkeley. And it's perfectly fine. And she makes like probably $90,000, right? Wow. <laughs> um, for the Hawaii Data Science Institute, there are lots of projects going on, but I want to highlight two. Troy Wooten, um, he grew up in uh, Lanai. Uh, his family owns a farm and they grow stuff. And he actually, he's really smart. He actually helped his mother write grant proposals. <laughs> um, Troy worked with me on a project called LandSage, which was trying to take the Sage decision-making software and share it with um, Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, to help them take data from landslides, from floods, and to visualize them in a way to help them make decisions more effectively and more accurately. So when Troy graduated after developing the software for them, he basically immediately got sucked up by the Hawaii State Energy Office. And so now he's acting on doing analytics and visualization for the State Energy Office. And in fact, the State Energy Office was so pleased with this, felt this partnership that they came back to fund additional student fellows at the Hawaii Data Science Institute because they want to keep that crank turning to bring in the latest talent who is savvy in data science and artificial intelligence to really transform how government makes decisions, to try and be a little more objective about <laughs> how to make some of these decisions. Um, Alberto Gonzalez, he came from Spain. He fell in love with Hawaii. He said, I want to live here if possible. Um, but he was incredibly entrepreneurial, and I'll tell you a bit about that in a moment. He worked on a project called DocuSage. And basically, this is the problem most scientists face. Every time you're trying to make a new discovery, you're trying to figure out who's done this already. How can you make sure you're really innovative? And in fact, it's not just scientists. Any company that's trying to be innovative, they want to protect their patents, right? They want to write a patent and protect it. How do you know other people haven't done this similar work? And so... And with the amount of publications that are out there, it's impossible for anyone to figure this out anymore. And for every generation of students, it's getting harder and harder for them to keep up with all the latest scientific discoveries, right? Thousands were of publications were generated just by COVID alone. Doctors can't keep up, right? To figure out what is the right thing to do for their patients. And so what DocuSage does is that it uses artificial intelligence to essentially read those documents to try and find those insights and correlate them in a way that you can see these papers are all trying to talk about the same problem. The, this here are a few papers that are trying to explore some new uh, ground that no one's has ever explored. And so by doing this, we have the opportunity then, then to look at unexplored territories where there might be new discoveries yet to be made. And so Alberto worked on this for his PhD and, but his heart was, a, was an entre entrepreneur. And so because he was working in my lab and he was using this, you know, the Sage uh, decision-making platform right here, he said, maybe I can form a company to develop 
this capability for businesses. And so with help from uh, the uh, UH's accelerator program, he won the business competition award. I think it was $10,000. And he was able to start Rendezvous, which is a company designed to do uh, deploy Sage in, in the commercial sector. And then uh, lastly, um, I want to talk about CreateX. So CreateX is it, this new lab I, I mentioned at UH West Oahu. Um, and the focus of it was to combine indigenous knowledge with technology, with science, with culture into this giant melting pot to see what we can innovate together. Uh, because what we're finding, especially in artificial intelligence, is that more and more indigenous populations are being left out of the conversation. And this is where it gets really dangerous because now you're training artificial intelligence without cultural participation, which means that you're potentially training artificial intelligence to be very biased, right? Bias against race, bias against culture, bias against gender, and so forth. So we felt it was important to try and bring these pieces together. So with, with the help of my, my PhD student, Kari Noe, um, to me, you know, she's my co-director, she's not my PhD student in this, um, we collaborated with Concordia University and we hosted the Indigenous Protocols in Artificial Intelligence Workshop, where we have, uh, you know, indigenous scholars from around the world, from New Zealand, you know, the Maori scholars, we have Native American scholars, we have, uh, 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 you know, Hawaiian scholars all come together to discuss what is the future of Hawaii for indigenous populations. And this project is continuing and we're working on new grants proposals uh, from the Canadian government to fund initiatives to link up uh, indigenous of uh, art and science research laboratories. And so one of the pieces that Kari created in this CreateX space, and I'm gonna pause this for a second and then I can show you this video. This is like a walkthrough of CreateX real fast. Come on, go, here we go. I'm gonna walk through the door and walk through the door really fast right now. And it's this 30 by 30 foot projection space uh, where we show computer graphics imagery. Um, some of you may have visited the uh, Van Gogh, Beyond Van Gogh exhibit uh, here in Hawaii. It's kind of like that, except we didn't know it was coming to Hawaii. So it was kind of coincident that they came to Hawaii. And what Wakari developed here was a system where a user could come in and there were all these Hawaiian language tiles, words. And by putting the words in the right order in correct Hawaiian grammar, you can command this EV bird to do something. So you can say, you know, the, 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 the bird flies over the trees or something like that. And then the bird would then go ahead and do it. So what this was that people don't realize until they're doing it is that they're actually learning to program a computer, but they're programming it in Hawaiian, right? This is, we felt this was an important bridge to go from folks who might not have been interested in computing to get them into computing by using a native language to allow them to do computational tasks. And in fact, the only reason why you have to learn a computer language, embarrassingly for computer scientists, is because we can't teach our computers yet to be smart enough to understand English or Hawaiian. Once we do, you can easily program a computer using natural language, right? The, the computer language is just yet another language. Um, the other project that we have there on, on show is the Hawaii Renewable Energy Visualization Table. We developed this in collaboration with Hawaii State Energy Office and a Hawaii Electric Company. The problem here is, you know, Hawaii wants to go to 100% re renewable by 2045. How do we do that? It just so happens that the perfect land for renewable energy, like solar, is also the perfect land for agriculture. Well, guess what? Hawaii wants to go to, to be you know, less dependent on, on bringing in external agriculture too. So what are we gonna do? Do we decide to abandon agriculture or do we decide to do a half-half split or what? And then also 
we want to put wind farms somewhere. Where? Well, maybe up north, where it's actually shown to be ideal for wind uh, energy production. But people don't like wind farms up there because we're killing bats, right? Um, and it's also ugly, right? All these issues, right? And so we thought what we need, what we needed was a way to visualize this information to the general public so that they can turn the dials and make a decision about what if I turn on more solar here? What if I turn on wind farms here? I turn, I move through time and I can see the build out and maybe I can start realizing that if I were to make simple blanket statements like, I don't want solar, I don't want this. Well, if you try the other options, then they may not be as be what you think it will be. And in fact, we actually had a legislator who was uh, staunchly um, um, against wind and said, we're not going to do wind because of all the issues in, in Kahuku. And he looked at our island and he turned on the layers and he said, we're going to do solar. That's the solution. And then he saw just how much land was going to be occupied by solar. And he said, oh, my God, I never realized that's the impact. That's not going to work. You know, we're going to displace a lot of agriculture, right? How we're going to do that and so now wind is back in the conversation but now it's going to move probably more offshore but then offshore has its issues too you know conserv conservationists are probably concerned about how does it affect whale migration patterns right so the point is not to prove anyone is right the point is to bring everyone to the table to start having this discussion where all the data all the data is on the table so people can talk at a simple level um, uh, making it more accessible to the general public as well as decision makers. Um, so for those of you who might be interested in seeing some of this stuff live, you know, contact me and then, I'll, you know, we can maybe arrange some kind of open house and you guys can, you know, stop by and kick the tires. Okay, so there's so many more projects. I don't have time to go through them all. Um, it's cool. And What's our special sauce? So how are we able to get all these things done and drum up so much excitement? Um, our, so I guess our secret sauce is everything that we do is kind of an open and social environment designed to foster creativity and self-motivation because we want the students to be the ones to drive this. Uh, because you know when you go through life, it, you now have someone telling you, you shouldn't have someone telling you what you should be doing next. You should be leading, right? And in, this, in our lab, we give them full autonomy. I mean, there's so many situations in my lab where I would go away on a Friday and then next morning, next Monday, the lab has been rearranged. The equipment has been rearranged because the students are trying to get work done. And they're trying to reorganize the lab to be more efficient for getting their work done. And so they would work together to figure this stuff out, give them autonomy, treat them like adults, right? We give them real world problems to solve. We train them in emerging science and technology, such as artificial intelligence. We give them competitive stipends. Um, I've only been to in Hawaii since 2014. When I started hiring graduate students, I budgeted uh, a budget at the same level as I did for students in Chicago. And they told me, wow, you're way overpaying the students here in Hawaii. I said, what? Um, this is what I paid folks in Chicago. And, and I found out that those graduate students here in, in, in Hawaii, they, were, they had multiple jobs. This particular graduate student, Dylan, which I mentioned earlier, he had three jobs. He would work for me, he would work for his dad, and he worked in a, a local high school doing IT. And I was thinking, wow, for the students who are the mainland, who are graduate students who have just one job, which was to do research in grad school, innovating, compared to a kid in Hawaii who has now worked three jobs, who do you think is going to be able to innovate faster? <laughs> right? Because you know, folks, kids in Hawaii have to have to scatter themselves across all these things. So I immediately raise their salaries to the level that would allow them to focus their attention. I mean, these are really brilliant kids. Honestly, they shouldn't be flipping burgers. I love burgers, but they shouldn't be the ones flipping burgers. We can use their talents in much better ways. And then lastly, give them every toy they want. 
um, I've met so many, I've been in so many situations where a, a student would say to me, oh, I would never do that approach because it would be impossible. I would never be afforded something like this, right? So they stop imagining what the solution could be because of, um, you know, the technology isn't there. And so in our lab, we say, well, the technology is there. Can it, can it remove that bottleneck so for you to move on? And say, well, yeah, but it's expensive. And so this is a student's idea of an expensive, expensive. that thing is $200 right and so in our lab we try to remove every one of these bars you got a good idea you can prove it's a good idea we'll figure out how to pay for it and get get you to get working as fast as possible okay so that kind of leads to the last bit of the secret sauce which is uh the big f word the funding <laughs> the funding word where do we get all this funding from so um since coming here i've been working on grant proposals uh gwen jacobs who co-directs the Data Science Institute has been doing a lot of work. Helen Turner, who's part of the Data Science Institute, uh, you know, uh, um, and we've been able to raise since 2014, 30, 30, $39 million. This is all from government agencies, National Science Foundation, uh, Army Research Lab, uh, 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 and so forth. And in some cases, you know, companies like Hawaiian Electric Company, uh, and you go, you know, wow, 39 million, hashtag awesome, we're done, right? Problem solved. Now, I just want you to keep in mind, remember I talked about San Diego in the beginning? Okay. Now, when we started the Hawaii Data Science Institute, David Lasner, you know, and, uh, you know, the president of a university, and at the time, the vice president for, uh, 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 Vice Chancellor for Research, um, uh, Bruno, Michael Bruno, gave us about $500,000 to start the Data Science Institute. You know, and in San Diego, they would have probably been writing grants like us to accumulate millions of dollars in funding from the National Science Foundation. But then on top of it, we had, they had one donor from basically a co-founder of Facebook come in and drop $75 million on their lap and said, we want you to build a building that's dedicated to data science research, right? So we thought, wow, we still got work to do. <laughs> you know, this is, this is our competition, right? So um, how, can, how can you help? I hope I'm actually talking to people who are potentially gonna donate to UH and not to my students, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but you know, your don people who donate to UH, um, your donation actually amplifies the research of our grants. It lets us take research and go even further by being able to hire more students to give them the training, to give them the opportunities to do the things that you saw we've done. Uh, the Lava Lab is a Lava Innovation Fund you can donate to. The Hawaii Data Science Institute uh, has student fellows that we fund every year that ended up that end up in industry. Uh, if you have a pet project you want to sponsor, you can do that too. If you want to help us build new supercomputers for Hawaii to advance forward, you can do that too. Or if you really want to go for the gusto and you know you need a data science building or artificial intelligence building so we can be competitive in the international circle go for it. And so that's all I, I had to say today. And um, sorry, this sound, kind of sound like a sales pitch. Um, but uh, if you want to get in contact me, uh, you can email me right here. And I'd be happy to introduce you to the lab, introduce you to Gwen Jacobs, and also answer any questions you might have. Aloha. Thank you so Anybody much. Still awake? Anybody still awake? <laughs> We are definitely here. Thank you so much. I'm going to open it up for questions at this point. So if anyone has questions, feel free to just uh, unmute your microphone or you can put something in the chat box. Either way. And I'd say while well, we're waiting for some others, oh, we have a hand raised from oh. EOR iPad number 13. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I'm uh, Regent Ernie Wilson, and uh, Jason, I want to ask you, uh, 
Have you pre-made this kind of a presentation to the Research Innovation Committee? Um, never. For the board? I've never okay. made, this is the first time I've made this presentation and this, I thought, oh, maybe I'll give it a try, see what happens. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I'm on that committee uh, besides, oh, okay. being, besides being chair of academic and okay. student affairs. Oh, I think okay. this, and uh, I've had discussion with the president about AI, so. Uh, okay. Very so interested. Okay, so I assume you like it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah, happy yeah, I'd like to. to. Yeah, I like to spend time talking with you anyway. So. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, happy to meet you in person, right. <laughs> or virtually. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> oh, we had a question from Dan about how useful is this, is this technology for ocean exploration. Um, you know, more and more of the ocean exploration involves collection of data and then an, an analysis. And the amount of data that's collected is so easy to collect now in some ways and so voluminous. There are a lot of organizations already using artificial intelligence to do data exploration. So in fact, we have faculty here at UH who are using AI to do, to do exploration. I can, I'm happy to, if you want to email me, I can introduce you to some of them some of the data science faculty, um, in particular, Maddie Belcade, who has a joint appointment in the Hawaii, uh, uh, HIMB, Hawaii, terrible of acronyms, uh, Marine Biology, Institute for Marine Biology and, and Computer Science. Jason, do you have any advice for students here, say in, K-12 sort of range, if they're really interested or excited, what do you recommend for them given what their future is going to look like, say in the next 10 years of their training? How might it change over that time? How do you think they should you know, tackle a career like this? Yeah, that's a good point. I think what they should do is, you know, not everyone's, you know, might be interested in being a hardcore computer scientist, right? You might be an artist, right? You but you know, everything is going to be touched by technology in some way, right? Like Hollywood, for example, all the films that you see being made are all computer, using computers, right? Uh, to, to store the media, to correct for errors in the, in the visuals, to create the special effects, it's all computer-based. Uh, my advice is basically, whatever you go into, have one mind or one foot into looking at how new technologies could potentially advance or transform the way I work. Always be aware of what's going on in that, in that area, because if you don't, you're going to be suddenly blindsided and then realize, oh my gosh, I have to completely retool and retrain myself. Um, you know, I have a friend of mine, close friend of mine, he's Tongan and he's a tattoo artist. He actually did all my, all my tattoos. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, and he has a kid that he's raising and I'm sending him tech all the time. I send him a little robot. I send him a little virtual reality goggles. And, you know, he's, he's visited me in Hawaii and also back in Chicago. And he's, he's, he's understands like, oh my gosh, the future of anything that we do is going to be wedded to technology. And so he's trying to make sure that his son is fully, you know, in sorry, tech savvy and science savvy as he pursues whatever dream uh, that he wants to pursue. Clem, go ahead. Uh, so how do we build sort of a public sandbox for students to play? I mean, I've, I've been out to the, to the West Oahu site and saw you know, the room with the 360 projection, which I think is just really fabulous and I think would attract tons of students to, to think about uh, technology differently. Um, yep. But, you know, here on the Manoa campus, you know, how, how do we have something like that that's open all the time or, and, you know, has the technology and the people that allow students just to experiment and play and get them interested? Right. Um, you know, obviously you need, like, uh, like I said, the infrastructure there, the tech, the tech that's actually there for people to play. Uh, you need to probably fund uh, students who can man these locations, right? And that's what I do here in my lab, for example. My lab, I consider an open lab 
basically any student that runs across me and say, hey, I found out about you from watching this TV program, or oftentimes they're like Hawaii News Now, can I come see the lab? And they will, they will come and I say, well, if you'd like to see what's going on here, and there are students here hanging around doing stuff all the time, you can come and either do a project in here, or you can just do your homework in here and get to know people. And maybe it's for you, maybe it's not, it's up to you, but just, I want you to be exposed to it. You know, and, and so that's what we do. And also at West Abahu, I have a student funded who basically mans that and I'm working on grants uh, in collaboration with uh, Kamwela Enos from the Office of Indigenous Innovation to, continue, to try and fund students from the Waianae area to bring them into the space, to let them work on projects together, and also to train some of the West Oahu faculty to leverage that space to develop capabilities for introducing students. So my, my, I've always had this kind of open policy of, and I have high school kids sometimes from like local schools say, hey, I wanna hang out and do stuff. And I, I don't restrict them because again, I'm going back to the Atari example. That's what made it possible for me because some guy in the Atari store said, would you like to hang out? And that <laughs> was it, you know, it's, you know, and uh, you know, professors can do that too in their labs, right? It depends on so, how much you care. Right? Yeah, so part of what I've been thinking is, you know, on the university library in here at Manoa, so as we rethink the Hamilton building, I'm trying to think about how we might build you know, sort of a mini version of, of some of this into the library, because libraries open tons of hours that would then, you know, feed a variety of programs across campus. Right. Yeah, I mean, come go. Have you, you've, I, I guess you visited West Oahu then. You've seen the. I've been places. to West Oahu and I have seen your parts of your lab be yep, before yep. COVID. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you know, I like to train students to do all this. I mean, in my lab, I only have one full time staff member who does technical stuff. Everything else I train students to do, and the students train other students because then when they graduate, they actually have a real skill. To right. Think, yeah. right? And, and that's how you pass it on, right? Thank you. And, but also one, one special thing, uh, you, you mentioned 24 access. That's a really good point. One of the problems I find at, at UH is that we don't allow people 24 access to things because we're afraid that people will steal stuff, <laughs> right? In the lab that I was in Chicago, it was 24 access. Students had access to buildings. Oh my God, crazy idea. Students have access to buildings. I mean, man, I live in Chicago. Chicago, I mean, we have probably like 10,000 times more crime than Hawaii. <laughs> Come on, we can do this. <laughs> Sorry, that was yeah, my no. <laughs> And, you know, because if we, if we keep, if we don't let the students in, I mean, we're treating them like students. We're not treating them like adults. We want them to be adults, right? right. And so that, that's my, 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 my feeling anyway. <laughs> I could be completely wrong. You know, somebody who's probably more knowledgeable about how to raise kids and probably have a better idea. Thank you, Jason. These are great ideas, great comments. It's a really interesting conversation. I, I'd like to divert just a moment to Sarah Lynn Smith, who is our UH Foundation representative for the College of Natural Sciences for a, a brief message from her, and then we'll come back to any other questions that are remaining for Jason Lee. So go ahead, Sarah Lynn. Uh, thanks, Allison. That's a hard act to follow. I don't, I, I really uh, um, so thrilled listening to you, Jason. And um, I, I just think what you're doing is phenomenal. And this is, though, from my perspective as uh, almost a year now with the College of Natural Sciences and getting acquainted with it, um, so uh, amazing that we have people like you and other scientists who are world famous doing cutting edge, amazing things. And that's why we're doing this webinar series because people don't know it. And um, so those of you who are here, I wanna thank you for attending. Um, we've been doing this now since July, once a month. And uh, this is new for the college. We haven't done this before. 
and we've reached out to alumni of the college, donors to the college, and a variety of other people, and hoping that we could begin getting this message out to the world about the phenomenal work that's being done here and the opportunities for students and faculty in the world here at UH. So I thank you all for attending. Um, and just to um, remind you, we, you know, we are doing this as a service and because we want you to know these things. So, uh, and we wanted to see how it went. So one, we would love to hear your comments. If you've liked today, or if you've liked the others you've attended, please let us know. Um, and if there's suggestions you have, we'd like to hear them. Also, this is the beginning of the, the season of Thanksgiving. And so we do wanna thank you for all of your support. And we hope that you will continue um, your support or add to your support to this college. And um, I think Jason gave a marvelous explanation for how funds are used and needed for his particular area. But I wanna remind you that also all of the areas of natural sciences are in need of funding. Um, our students need it. And he did a great job of explaining the difference between here and the mainland and how we can make our students more competitive who are so brilliant and deserve to be supported. And thank you, Jason, for making that um, wonderful explanation that was so helpful. Um, and I just wanna ho hope that all of you, as the year winds up, you consider giving to the College of Natural Sciences. And if I can help you in any way, we've put in the chat room my contact information if you you know uh, you're if you want to give generally to the College of Natural Sciences, we can do that. Or if you want to create an account for a particular area you're interested in, or if you want to talk to me about ways of giving cash, stock transfers, estate plan gifts, various ways of giving, please feel free to contact me at any time. I'd love to talk with you, and I will be happy to join you to go visit Jason and <laughs> in his lab <laughs> and we can uh, we can learn more together um but thank you very much very welcome sarah lynn thank you for inviting me yeah, absolutely thank you sarah lynn and thank you very much jason are there other questions for jason yeah as far as you know like an open house kind of thing you know i think with COVID starting to lift and you know our UH's you know plan to go back fully open in the spring I think spring would be a probably a great time for for us hosting some kind of open house where you can just come in and have some fun play with some stuff that students have cooked up I mean I, I've only scratched the surface uh, on on what the things that we've done so far um, also oh one more thing the Hawaii Data Science Institute, we will have a kind of an end of semester presentation of all the Hawaii Data Science uh, Institute fellows uh, projects. And that will also be done virtually. Uh, eventually, we'll go, we'll go uh, back to live. But if you're interested in that, send me some email. I'll also uh, get you on that mailing list too. That's another, you know, that's our future again. Yeah. Absolutely. We're all very much looking forward to things getting a little bit more back to normal and things opening up more so that we can all get back together in person, which is definitely um, pretty rewarding. And I think we'll all appreciate those opportunities when they um, really come back to us next semester. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank you, Jason. We really, really appreciate you joining us today. It was a marvelous presentation and it was so nice and refreshing to hear about the development of your lab, all these wonderful people that you have fostered as you have this lab um, here at UH Manoa and all the wonderful things that they're doing now. So thank you for your message. We really appreciate that. Um, it's great to see you all here today. Thanks for joining us. We are planning to hold our next event on December 8th at 2 p.m. It's a Wednesday. And uh, next month's speaker will be Dr. Robert Jeddick from the Institute for Astronomy. 
He's going to have a very timely talk for us entitled Einstein versus Santa, his Santa breaking the laws of relativity. So please join us for our December themed presentation next month. You'll all be receiving invitations to this event in your email inboxes. So watch for it there. Aloha, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day or your evening, and we will see you soon. Bye, all.